women stand at the edge of a busy street in Bangkok, Thailand. They're office workers, and they've come outside for a chat and a smoke. Not far away, a young man and woman talk under a shade tree near a row of parked cars. They're also taking a smoke break. On an office building terrace, a long-haired man in a loose t-shirt leans on the rail and takes a deep drag on his cigarette. It's 2012, and this is a common sight around the city. For the past 70 years, the Thai government has been battling the tobacco industry. They've imposed heavy taxes on cigarettes and banned advertising. They prohibited sales to anyone under 18. They've made it illegal to smoke outside designated areas. Every pack sold in the country is plastered with health warnings with gruesome photos of blackened lungs and rotten teeth. Surveys show that 97% of Thai adults know that smoking causes serious illness. Still, more than one in five of them smoke. Enter the smoking kid. A skinny boy in a black t-shirt approaches two men smoking on a busy sidewalk. He's maybe nine years old, and he holds an unlit cigarette between his fingers. Can I get a light, he asks. The men say, no, of course not. You know it's bad for you, right? Smoking causes lung cancer and emphysema. Meanwhile, a little girl with pigtails walks up to a pair of smoking women. She also holds up a cigarette and asks for a light. Again, no dice. Don't you know smoking is bad for you, they tell her? If you get cancer, they drill a hole in your throat. Every smoker the kids approach has pretty much the same response. Cigarettes are poison. Smoking is dangerous. Just don't do it. If it's so bad, the children ask, then why do you do it? Then they hand them a flyer with a phone number for a national quitters hotline. The smokers are real, but the boy and girl are actors, hired as part of an ad campaign designed by Ogilvy Thailand for the Thai Health Promotion Foundation. The kids are mic'd, and the encounters are filmed from a distance. The foundation airs the clips on Thai TV. They post them online and get hundreds of thousands of hits. Calls to the quit line jump 40%, all for a budget of $5,000. For Jonah Berger, author of a new book on changing people's minds, it's a great example of a powerful truth, that the best way to try to convince people of something is to get them to convince themselves. Hi, I'm Kwame Christian, CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I have a quick question for you. When was the last time you had a difficult conversation? These conversations happen all the time, and that's exactly why you should listen to Negotiate Anything, the number one negotiation podcast in the world. We produce episodes every single day to help you lead, persuade, and resolve conflicts both at work and at home. So level up your negotiation skills by making Negotiate Anything part of your daily routine. From Wondery, I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. I founded The Next Big Idea Club with Malcolm Gladwell, Susan Kane, Daniel Pink, and Adam Grant to connect people to some of the boldest thinking shaping our culture and our future. Each week on the podcast, we bring you one idea with the power to change the way you see the world. This week, how to change people's minds. When Wharton School professor Jonah Berger set out to write a book about persuasion, he talked to salespeople, CEOs, hostage negotiators, substance abuse counselors, and a slew of others. He wanted to know, why is it so hard for people to change their minds? What stands in the way? And the same five barriers kept coming up. The first is reactance. That's react, A-N-C-E, which is basically when you push someone, they push back. Second is endowment. Folks are attached to what they already have. Third is distance. There's only so far people are willing to travel from their comfort zone. Fourth is uncertainty. If people have doubts, it's hard to get them to accept something new. And fifth is what Berger calls corroborating evidence. That is, for people to be convinced of something, they need to hear it from more than one source. Berger looked down at his notes and beheld... A pretty freaking awesome acronym. 
reduce. It wasn't just a random memory aid. It was the essence, it seemed to him, of what it takes to change people's attitudes and behaviors. Not more persuasion, but less friction. And he spells it all out in his new book, The Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind. Jonah Berger, thank you for joining us on the Next Big Idea podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So Jonah, you are a professor of marketing at Wharton. And you've written a book called The Catalyst, which is on a topic of, I think, universal interest, how to change people's minds. What caused you to want to write this book? So a few years ago, I had an interesting change that happened in my life. So by training, I'm an academic. I have a PhD. It's in marketing. I'm a behavioral scientist. I do lots of academic research. I love teaching. I love doing academic research. I had some business experience, but actually not a whole lot. But I wrote a book called Contagious that really sort of changed my life to some degree. Hmm. Suddenly, I was consulting for all sorts of companies, everything from big Fortune 500s like the Googles and the Apples and the Nikes of the world to small startups, B2B, uh, B2C, services, ideas, products, everything in between. And I got to learn a lot about businesses and their challenges, people and their challenges. And I realized many of us have something in common, which is we all have something that we want to change. Mm -hmm. So we think about it in the business world, great leaders want to transform organizations and employees want to change their boss's mind. Folks in marketing want to change consumer behavior and folks in you know, R&D want everyone else in the company to listen to them. If you think about our personal lives, we want to change our spouse's mind about where to go to vacation. We want to change our parents' mind about how often they come to visit and we want to get our kids to eat vegetables. And same with society more broadly, right? Whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or politicians or nonprofits, they all have something they want to change. But change is really hard. We push and we prod and we pressure and we cajole and often nothing happens. And so what I wondered is, well, could there be a better way? Mm -hmm. Could there be a better way to change minds and drive action? And it turns out there is. It really requires a different way of thinking about how change works and taking a slightly different perspective. Let's start with our personal lives. On a human level, we all want to make an impact. We want to bend the world with the force of our will. People fantasize about bending spoons by concentrating. Wouldn't that be nice? But it would be far more useful to be able to actually change other people's minds now and then. This feels like a more difficult task than bending a spoon. You say that people are not like chairs. This was eye-opening for me. (laughs) Why are people not like chairs? You know, I, I think when we think about changing minds, we tend to resort to a certain type of approach. And I would describe that approach as pushing. We add more reasons, more facts, more figures, more information. We just assume if we just push people a little bit harder, they'll come around. And I think it's clear why we think that works. Going back to the chair you asked about, you know, if there's a chair in the middle of a room and we want to get that chair to go in a particular direction, pushing is really good way to get it to go. And so we tend to think that same approach will work in the social world. That if I just push my spouse a little bit more, that if I just push the person that I want to go along, they'll do so. But there's a problem, which is that unlike chairs, when you push people, they tend to push back. And so what else can we do? And it turns out an interesting analogy comes up from chemistry. So obviously we think social change is hard. Change is even harder in the chemical world, right? So think about you know plant matter being turned uh, over eons uh, into oil or carbon being turned into diamonds. And it often takes a long time for change to occur. And so chemists often add temperature and pressure to speed change. Right? So you want to turn one chemical into another chemical, you increase the heat, you put it under a lot of pressure, and eventually it changes. You push it harder, it changes. But there are a special set of substances that chemists often use to make change happen faster and easier. They don't add more temperature, and they don't add more pressure. Instead, what they do is they lower the barriers to change. They figure out an easier way to make the same amount of change happen with less energy, not more. And these substances very simply are called catalysts. And when we think about catalysts and the the lay way we use the word, it means a change agent, right? A catalyst is someone who encourages change to happen, but it actually has a much deeper meaning than that. True catalysts, they don't push harder. They don't provide more facts or more reasons or more information. Just like catalysts in chemistry, they identify the barriers to change and they mitigate them. They lower the obstacles and they make it easier for change to occur. I think a good analogy to me is thinking about getting in your car You want to get your car to go. You stick your key in the ignition, you turn the key, and you you push your foot on the gas. Um, When we want people to change, whether in our personal lives or professional lives, if they don't move, if they don't budge, we think we just need more gas. 
If we just push harder on that gas pedal, the people or the car will go. But sometimes it's not about stepping on the gas. More often, it's about removing the parking brake. We're so focused on pushing, we never take a moment to go, oh, wait a second, why hasn't that person changed already? What's the thing getting in the way of them changing? And rather than just adding more pressure and more pushing, how can I get rid of that obstacle and make them more likely to change? You point out that we all have this kind of built-in anti-persuasion radar. I love this notion. We're just highly skeptical when we think someone's trying to persuade us of something. And I think we feel this, right? We feel it when the TV commercial comes on or when somebody is kind of overly headstrong with an argument. There's just a door that closes in our minds when we feel like we're being sold. And I wonder, where does this come from? Why do we respond this way? Yeah, I think there's a story that illustrates this really nicely. Uh, a number of years ago, Tide, owned by Procter & Gamble, wanted to make doing laundry easier for folks. And so they come up with these things called Tide Pods. They're basically little packets of detergent done in a particular way that allows them to release different things at different times. And they spent a huge amount of money on marketing, over $100 million, thought it had a big opportunity to take a big chunk uh, of the over billion dollar laundry industry. So Tide Pods come out. And they do okay, uh, but then something interesting happens. A few years later, there's a problem. And the problem, very simply, is that people are eating them. Now, I, I pause there for a second because someone listening to this is going, wait, I, I must have misheard him, right? There's no way people are eating Tide Pods. Aren't they filled with lots of chemicals? They are filled with lots of chemicals. And people are eating them. Why? Well, there's a funny video on College Humor. There was a satirical article in The Onion. Soon, young people, for the most part, are challenging each other online to eat Tide Pods. It's called the Tide Pod Challenge. And so the Tide executives do what anyone in their right mind would do in this situation. They issue an announcement telling people not to do it. They say, hey, don't eat Tide Pods. And in case that's not enough, they hire a celebrity, Rob Gronk Gronkowski of New England Patriots mm. fame, to shoot a sort of quick public service announcement saying, should every Tide Pods? No. Eat them in some cases? No, 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 no. Put it online, social media. They'll pay attention to Gronk. They may not listen to us, but they'll listen to Gronk. Gronk tells them, no, they won't, they won't do it. And that's exactly when all hell breaks loose. So if you look at Google search data, there's a 400% increase uh, in the searches for Tide Pods and things like the Tide Pod Challenge. Visits to poison control shoot up as well. Uh, in the next two weeks or so, more people come into poison control with similar sort of issues than had come in in the two years prior. Essentially, a warning had become a recommendation. Telling people not to eat Tide Pods had made them more likely to do it. Now, that's an interesting story. Uh, it's sort of a cute, interesting anecdote, but I think it shows a much broader principle which is when you tell people not to do something, it often makes them more likely to do it. Or even when you tell them to do something, it can make them less likely to do it because people tend to want to do the opposite of what we suggest, right? And essentially, this is about the principle of reactance. We love to feel like there's freedom and control over what we're doing. Why did I buy a certain product, use a certain service? Why am I choosing to wear a mask or not? Why did I go watch this movie rather than some other movie? I chose it. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm the reason that I'm doing that particular thing. But the challenge is as soon as somebody tries to influence us, right? Wear a mask, for example, watch this movie rather than that movie, please clean your dishes or, you know, do whatever we might ask someone else to do. As soon as we try to influence someone else's behavior, it impinges on their ability to see that behavior as driven by themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I might've thought, oh, I wanted to watch this movie, or maybe I thought wearing a mask was a good idea because it will uh, help protect the people around me. Now, if the government tells me to wear a mask, Suddenly I'm going, well, am I wearing a mask because I wanted to wear a mask? I'm in the driver's seat or because the government told me. And the more I feel like it's because someone else told me, the less interested I am in doing it. So then the challenge becomes, if we want to change minds, if we want to change action, if we want to change behavior, we have to stop selling and we have to get people to buy in. We have to stop trying to persuade people and encourage them to persuade themselves, figure out a way to give them back some freedom and some agency, and in so doing, encourage them to change. You hear the Tide Pods story, this rash of people eating Tide Pods. Listeners, please do not eat Tide Pods. And on the one hand, you think Darwinian awards, like this seems poorly aligned with survival impulses. Like why would we evolve this kind of contrarian impulse? On the other hand, as you point out in the book, our instinct to protect our freedom of choice and our autonomy as individuals is just deeply, powerfully ingrained. You ever think about sort of the, from an evolutionary point of view, 
Were there snake oil salesmen in our ancestral environment, hucksters selling loincloths? Like, how was it that we developed this incredibly kind of ferociously independent, freedom-loving instinct? I think part of it is growing up, right? Part of it is developmental. When we're young, we are very much part of our family and that's who we are. But as we get older, part of our job and our role is to sort of distinguish ourselves and, and separate ourselves. Yeah. And so I think that's why you see a, a little bit of the pushing back. But I very much agree with the point about sort of, you know, is this always evolutionarily right? And, you know, often finding the cases where people do weird things provides deep insight into human behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I was writing the book, I wrote the Tide Pod story. I thought it was an interesting story, but I was like, you know, things like this don't ever happen. Mm -hmm. And then COVID and coronavirus come mm -hmm. and you've got all these people that aren't wearing masks, mm -hmm. aren't doing social distancing. And part of the reason is because other people are telling them what to do, yeah. right? And the government just took the same playbook that they've always had. If, if it's a health behavior and it's a good idea, do more of it right? Eat more vegetables, exercise more, wear masks. If it's a bad behavior, tell people not to do it. Don't drink and drive, don't smoke. And in this case, don't go out of your home for a period. And while that seems like a really clear way to communicate information, in many cases, I think it had adverse effects because some people might've said, well, look, yeah, sure. I, I'd wear a mask myself. I mean, if I was making the decision, maybe I'd wear a mask, but if you're telling me to do it, well, now I don't want to, right? I don't want to seem like I'm just following along with whatever you're suggesting. I want to feel some freedom and some independence. I noted that Governor Cuomo in New York was quite good about saying, these are our recommendations and we trust New Yorkers to do the right thing. And I'm presenting you with all this data and, it, and that appeared to be relatively effective. Yeah, I mean, the goal, again, is to give people some of that control, right? I mean, if he tells you wear a mask, you kind of say, screw you. Who are you to tell me what to do? If he says, here's the information, you can make whatever choice you want, you go, huh, let me look at that information. Well, let me see. It seems like a really bad idea not to wear a mask. Notice he gets to choose what information he's giving you, right? So he's not just giving you any information. He's guiding the journey. It's not completely hands-off, but he's also not forcing you in a particular direction. I mean, if you tell people wear a mask, they're going to say, don't tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want. If you instead say to people, hey, you know, imagine you brought your elderly mom and dad or your grandparents or your, uh, you know, eight-year-old son or daughter to work, would you wish that everyone else was wearing a mask when you brought them into the office? person would probably think about it and go, well, yeah, actually, I, I probably would. Well, then why aren't you wearing a mask right now? Mm -hmm. right? And again, not telling them what to do, but really providing them with the questions that guide and shape that journey that encourage them to reach a desired conclusion, but don't force that conclusion. And we had a, a really extraordinary example of this at the top of the show with the story of the smoking kit campaign in Thailand. Yeah. So what I think is really clever about that campaign is very similar to what we just talked about with someone in the office, right? If you tell someone, don't smoke, they'll say, don't tell me what to do. It's my freedom and my right to smoke. I can do whatever I want. But if you instead say, hey, would you want an eight-year-old kid to smoke or a 10-year-old kid to smoke? You'd of course say no. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if that kid asks you, hey, can you give me a light? You'd say no, just as they did in the campaign. And then if you encourage people to sort of notice what they did, say, you're smoking, but you're telling kids not to smoke. Implicitly, what you're doing is you're saying, here's your attitude, here's your action, and they don't line up. I'm not going to force you to make them line up, but I'm going to draw your attention to this inconsistency. Cognitive dissonance is going to do the rest of the work, right? Your own mind is going to do the rest of the work to say, hey, I've got a choice now. I can either keep smoking and tell that kid that smoking is okay, or maybe I should think about smoking a little less myself. I need to bring those two things in line. And so I'm going to do the work to bring them a, a little bit more in line. And, and I think it's a really powerful strategy. In an office context, for example, I, I was talking to someone who was trying to get a colleague to kill an old project. Right? So I had this old project that was way over budget and wasn't performing as much as they had hoped. And you know they were still throwing money at it. And every time they told the colleague, kill this project, the colleague would say, no, no, it's my favorite project. I like it. I don't want to kill it. And so instead, the person took a slightly different tack. They said, you know, given what we know now, Imagine another part of the organization wanted to do a similar project, or imagine someone at a different company wanted to do a similar project. Would you recommend that they do a project like that? And the person said, well, no. I mean, given what I know now, I didn't know it at the beginning, but now I know, you know it didn't work out. We lost all this money. Okay, great. Why are we still doing it? Because again, you're not telling them, hey, kill the project, but you're pointing out if you wouldn't recommend this to someone else, why are you continuing to do it yourself? And so Pointing out that gap, highlighting that gap between attitudes and action encourages people to do the work themselves. 
highlighting gaps, letting people convince themselves, giving them a sense of autonomy and control, powerful strategies for getting someone to kill a project or buy a product or even stop smoking. But how can we be catalysts in our own lives? Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spark wherever you enjoy podcasts. It's a Sunday morning in Lincoln, Nebraska, 1991. Michael and Julie Weiser have just moved house and they're still unpacking boxes when the phone rings in the kitchen. Michael answers and a male voice says, you'll be sorry you ever moved to 5810 Randolph Street, Jew boy. And then the line goes dead. Michael Weiser is a cantor, a singer at a local synagogue. Lincoln is a mostly evangelical town and the Weisers have heard the occasional slur but they've never been threatened directly like this. The fact that the caller knows their address is especially disturbing. A couple days later, Julie comes home to find a fat envelope in the mailbox. It's stuffed with Nazi and white supremacist pamphlets and flyers. There's also a card with the words, the KKK is watching you, scum. Worried for their kids, they call the police, who tell them they suspect a man named Larry Trapp. Trapp is Grand Dragon of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He's the highest ranking Klansman in Nebraska. The police have hauled him in countless times. They suspect he was behind the recent burning of a Vietnamese refugee center. He's known to stockpile weapons and explosives. The Weisers change the locks on their doors. They vary their routes to work and to school. Julie asks around about Trapp. It turns out he's severely diabetic. He's nearly blind and both his legs have been amputated. But he's so violent and abusive, none of the local doctors want to treat him. Michael hates being held hostage to fear, so he finds Trapp's phone number and calls him. There's no answer. He calls again and again. Finally, he leaves a message. He says, Larry, you better think about all this hatred you're spreading, because one day you're going to have to answer to God. Just saying it gives him relief. So he keeps phoning and leaving messages. He calls them love notes. Why do you hate me, he says. Or, Larry, there's a lot of love out there and you're not getting any of it. Then one day, Larry picks up. He swears at Michael and asks him why he's harassing him. Michael says he knows he's disabled and asks if he needs any help, like getting groceries or anything else. Larry's clearly flustered. He pauses and clears his throat. That's nice of you, he finally says, but I've got it covered. Then one Saturday night, it's Larry who calls. He's upset. I want to get out, he tells Michael, but I don't know how. Michael and Julie drive to his apartment, and when Larry greets them, he bursts into tears. He pulls three swastika rings from his fingers and says, I'm so sorry for the things I've done. They sit under a Nazi flag and talk for hours. Larry formally resigns from the KKK and issues a public apology. But his health is getting worse. The doctors tell him he has a year to live. The Weisers invite him to move in with them, and he accepts sleeping in their living room. He studies Judaism, and in June 1992, he converts in a ceremony in Michael's synagogue. I was one of the most hard case white activists in the US, Larry tells an interviewer before he dies that September. If I can have that change of mind or change of heart, anybody can. In The Catalyst, Jonah Berger writes that Larry didn't change because Michael told him to. Quote, he changed because he came to that conclusion on his own terms. But Michael didn't just stand on the sidelines. He reduced reactants, guiding Larry down a path Larry could explore himself. I think there are two interesting things about this story. The first is when writing this book and having the subtitle, How to Change Anyone's Mind, I got a lot of pushback from various people that said, yeah, you can change some people's mind, but you can't change everybody's mind. 
And so one question was really, can we change anyone's mind? Can we really find some situations where you wouldn't think someone would change their mind, but they did? And that's really what amazed me and I found so powerful about this story is even in a case where someone is a devout racist, they can be encouraged to come along But I think that word encourage is really important Mm. because as we talked about, what the Weissers didn't do is they didn't say, hey, stop doing this. They didn't say, hey, you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. They didn't do, in some sense, what the police had done many times before, Mm. which is threaten him, tell him to stop, tell him why it was such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Instead, they were very open and very friendly, and they also tried to figure out a little bit of why he was doing it in the first place. Instead of sort of pushing them, they asked questions. Instead of trying to persuade them or telling him, hey, what you're doing is terrible, which it obviously is and was, instead they sort of said, we're here, we're open, we're listening. If you want to come talk, come talk. And eventually he did, right? Because what what they realized is that someone that feels this negatively probably has a reason. And that reason may not be a good reason in a sense of it's a right reason for what they're doing, but if someone's willing to listen to them, that person may be willing to come around. And that's in fact what he did. And so even though it's a situation that I think many of us will never face, it's a really powerful example of someone coming around even in the most unlikely of circumstances. As you know, and as you write about in the book, reactance is very pronounced in children, or at least in my children. I think, Jonah, you have a young child, do you not? I do, actually. We just welcomed a second child. We have an almost three-year-old and about a three-month-old. Oh, congratulations. Or as I say to friends, congratulations and commiserations. Yes. (laughs) You have a lot of reactants coming your way. Uh, Yes, I've already experienced it to a good degree, and it's been fun to sort of play out some of the things I've learned through writing the book with the kids. I wish I had read this book 10 years ago when my children were your children's age. You'll have the benefit of this research behind you because there's really a lot of highly relevant and practical parenting advice in this book. Among other things, like I've found, for instance, that my strong desire for my children to read books rather than play video games has not had the desired effect. (laughs) You know, it sometimes occurred to me that had I said, we're going to have reading time limits in this household. You are not allowed to read for more than 45 minutes per day in this household. That might have been more effective than my eat your kale and read your books encouragement. Certainly, yeah. And, and I think what I find interesting is we all see reactants in kids, right? When we tend to think it's a, like a teenager thing, we do it all the time. Mm-hmm. We do it with our spouses. Sure. We do it. One of my favorite examples of this in a family context is, you know, someone says, what do you want to do this weekend? That person could either be your spouse or your friend. And you say, let's go to a movie. Uh, you may not have even cared that much, but you came up with something to do. The person will often say, no, I, no, I don't want to do that. If they had come up with it, they might have liked it just fine. But the fact that you suggested it, again, that radar goes off. Okay, you want to see a movie. Well, let me think about that. Let me think about all the reasons why that might not be the best thing. And so one thing I talk about in the book is essentially providing a menu or giving people a choice, right? Rather than saying, let's go out to the movies, say, hey, we could go out to the movies or we could go to Chinese food. At least pre-COVID, we could do those things. And so now suddenly you've shifted the role of the listener. Right? Rather than sitting there and thinking about all the reasons why they don't like what you've suggested, now you've put them in a different position. Now they're thinking about, well, which of these two things do I like better? And because they're thinking about which one they like better, they're much more likely to choose one at the end. And notice you're not giving people 10 or 15 or 100 choices. You're giving them a limited choice set, but you're choosing the choice set. Right? You're guiding that journey by giving them a set of options that you're pretty happy with and letting them choose from within them, making them feel like they have some freedom and some agency and control, but also encouraging them to go in the direction you want them to. Yes, I love the would you rather start with carrots or broccoli, providing a menu, very, very effective. Um, you know, Del McCurry, the legendary bluegrass musician, was asked how his two sons became virtuosos also as bluegrass musicians. And he said, oh, that was easy. I just put a mandolin on the bed and said, don't touch it. (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is kind of great. I mean, I wonder if there are ways to just sort of use that kind of reverse psychology. Yeah, I mean, people even do things like they say, look, you can't have your broccoli until you finish your chicken, right? Okay, fine, but I really want it. I can't have it yet. Okay. And so it encourages them to eat the other healthy thing. You're not saying, hey, you can't have your broccoli until you eat your ice cream, but you're setting it up that the reward isn't the ice cream. The reward is the broccoli, which makes it more desirable. One of the things I, I realized reading your book, it's not just other people who are intransigent and stubborn. Often our own minds need changing. Do we need to catalyze ourselves? How do you think about applying the insights in this research to our relationship with ourselves? 
I really wrote the book with changing others in mind because I think that's something all of us come across. Mm -hmm. And this is not designed as a, a self-help book. It's not a you know 10-step program to doing whatever you're hoping to achieve. But we can use a lot of these ideas to change and help change our own minds. So the idea of corroborating evidence, for example, that fifth barrier that I talk about is really all about multiple sources, multiple pieces of proof or evidence changing minds, right? We can use that to encourage us to change our own behavior. The idea of asking for less and asking for more, chunking the change that I talk about in the distance chapter, we can mm -hmm. apply that same idea to our own goals and our own habits and our own behaviors. And so I think we can really use similar ideas to change our own behavior. So we've talked about reactants. Now, E is for endowment, as you said, which I understand to be the idea that people value the status quo and find it hard to let go of things they're invested in. Yeah, there's sort of two directions to think about change, right? We're not just trying to get someone to do something. Anytime we're trying to get them to change, we're getting to switch from one thing to something else. And there are actually two separate pieces of that that are quite important. So endowment is about our attachment to what we've been doing. It really doesn't have much to do with what's coming up, the new thing, mm -hmm. the thing we're trying to get people to switch to or change to. It's really just we're attached to old things, right? The longer you live in a home, for example, the more value you think it has, even above and beyond market price. We tend to do the same stuff again and again. We become emotionally attached to it. It's hard to let go. On the other side, we're also neophobic. We're also scared of new things, in part because new things always involve uncertainty, right? And so it's both that we're attached to the old things, and that's what endowment is about, but also it's about that new things involve some level of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is a barrier we have to reduce. I love the example of the simple white mug, where if you show people this very simple, plain, normal white mug with a handle and ask, what would you pay for it? The average response is $3. If you say, this is a white mug that you own, how much would you sell it for? The average ends up being $7, <laughs> right? An extraordinary disparity. And I think what that shows is if we're already doing it, if it's our mug, we value it more than if it's a mug that's not ours, right? Because it's ours, because we've been endowed with it, mm -hmm. because we're attached to it, and for a variety of other reasons as well, we value it more. And, and the same thing is true more generally. We don't often pay for mugs, and so mugs are a little bit of a weird thing to think about. But an idea, if it's our idea, we think it's a better idea than if it's someone else's. If it's the product I've been using, we think it's going to be better than the product I haven't used yet, right? We become attached attached to that thing, and it's hard to let it go. Let's talk about some of the ways that these principles can be applied to changing the world on a broader scale. One story that's top of mind for many of us right now is the way the killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis in May has catalyzed a major movement all of a sudden. Certainly. I mean, I think what we've seen with Black Lives Matter and a lot of social movements recently really echoes a lot of what I discuss in the book. There's two things to separate, right? One is how much attention an issue gets, and another is whether that issue drives actual change. We've uh, looked at some data in a, a variety of different situations. So things like school shootings, for example, or support of a variety of issues. And what we see is when those things are condensed in time, so let's say two things happen, there are two school shootings, when they're closer together in time, it's more likely to drive action. And what's a little bit weird about that is it's the same thing, right? Shootings are terrible things mm -hmm. over a six-month period, whether two shootings, one today and one in five months versus one today and one next week, it's the same number of shootings. But what having them condensed does is it provides, in some sense, more ready, accessible information that this thing is a problem. There's a nice sort of proverb that someone shared with me, which goes something along the lines of, if a person says you have a tail, you laugh. But if five people say you have a tail, you turn around to take a look. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the core is what the idea of corroborating evidence is, right? One thing happening provides some information, right? One friend of yours, for example, putting solar panels on their home, that's interesting. Okay. Not enough to sort of tip the scales to make me do it, but two, three, five, seven people is much more likely to drive action. And what's I think interesting about that is sure the same person could come back and tell you again why it's great, right? They could say, oh, I, I put solar panels on my let me tell you more reasons why it's good. And you might think, well, more information from the same person is equally good for two different people, but it's not, right? Because when you have two different people doing something, it provides more evidence that, wow, different people, even in slightly different circumstances, found this thing valuable or found it important, so it's worth doing. And so what the research sort of suggests is, you know, if we want to change minds first, Use multiple sources. Use corroborating evidence. When I talk to uh, substance abuse counselors, for example, they often use interventions. 
And interventions work for a variety of reasons, but part of the reasons why interventions work and are so effective is a whole bunch of people come together to say the same thing at the same time. Sure, a sister and a cousin and an uncle might have all said the same thing, but it's spread out over time. Condensing that at one point in time Mm -hmm. makes people realize, wow, this is a really big problem and I should take action. And the same thing is true in a, in a business context, in a personal context, or in a context of social movements more broadly, right? Focusing attention on something in a short period by having multiple occasions and multiple news articles written about an issue is more likely to drive people to think it's big enough that it requires solving. So we've talked about most of the roadblocks in Jonah Berger's Reduce formula, getting reactant kids to eat broccoli, getting endowed mug owners to adjust their prices, bringing corroborating evidence to bear on important social issues. But Jonah teaches business, and that's where changing minds meets the bottom line. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Over at the Next Big Idea Club, we're all about reducing barriers and knocking down roadblocks to feeling the power of big, bold ideas. We're also dedicated to making it as easy as possible for you to join. We're a vibrant online community of readers and writers and lifelong learners, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. Sign up for three months for free and get the best in new life-changing nonfiction books along with video and audio from the authors themselves that let you absorb their key ideas in just minutes. Check it out at nextbigideaclub.com. That's nextbigideaclub.com. The Catalyst is Jonah Berger's third book. The first was the bestseller Contagious from 2013 about why some products and ideas catch on while others don't. In 2017, he published Invisible Influence on the hidden forces that shape behavior. His ideas on why we do what we do and how we can do it better have put him on the A-list of American business writers. It's no wonder that The Catalyst takes many of its examples from the business world. Let's get into how we can apply these principles to be more effective at work. I love the story of ShoeSite.com. Could you share that with us? So a number of years ago in San Francisco Bay Area, a guy was walking on a mall looking for a pair of Airwalks. One store had the right color, but not the right size. Another store had the right size, but not the right color. And it was the era of the dot-com boom out in Silicon Valley. And he was sitting there going, well, why isn't there a site online where people can buy shoes? I mean, rather than having to go from store to store and hope they have the right color and the right style and the right size, I mean, I know what I want. Why can't I just go online and find it? And so he starts a company called ShoeSite.com. And ShoeSite.com sells shoes online, but it was having some trouble. And this was early 2000s. And it's easy today to think about, you know, we get everything online. We get mortgages online. We get pets online. We find spouses online, houses online. But initially, that wasn't necessarily the case, right? E-commerce had some trouble getting off the ground. People didn't know the companies they were buying from. They were used to seeing physical goods in front of them. And so they were a little bit worried uh, about shopping online. And so they got some traction, but not enough. They thought about dropping prices of the shoes, but that wouldn't make the shoe companies happy. And so they had to figure out some way to get some more customers. People were used to buying shoes offline. They essentially wanted to try the product before having to pay for it. And so they were sitting there going, well, what can we do? We can't set up physical stores. That's not going to work for us. So instead, in sort of a a stroke of genius that seems obvious today looking back, but at the time was sort of unusual, they said, let's try shipping people's shoes for free. Now you can get as many pairs of shoes as you want for free. 
and uh, you can also send them back for free. And it doesn't take off right away, but some more people start buying some shoes, and then some more people start buying some shoes, and then more people buy shoes, and they sell a few million dollars worth of merchandise, and they start selling tens of millions of dollars uh, of merchandise. Eventually, now they're a huge over billion dollar business. They were bought by another company, and they also enabled the entire internet to happen, right? They were really one of the first companies to do free shipping. And if you're sitting there going, well, if they're so popular, why have I never heard of shoesite.com? That's because you're probably familiar with the name they eventually adopted, building on the Spanish word for shoes or zapatos, or as we know today, Zappos. And Zappos was one of the first companies, if not the first company, to do free shipping online. And you might be sitting there going, well, why does free shipping really matter? But if you think about it, the way shopping online works is if there's no free shipping, you have to pay money to get a product. Only then do you get to see if you like it. And if you don't like it, you have to pay people then to send it back which is terrible, right? If I told you that there was a magic box and you could stick some money in that box and then you'd have to stick some more money in that box and it would give you something. And then if you didn't like that thing, you'd have to stick even more money in the box and then it'd give you some of your money back. You'd say, well, I'm not playing that game. That sounds like a terrible game. That was internet e-commerce shopping at the time. And so what free shipping did is it allowed people to experience the offering. Right? It allowed people to say, hey, look, I, I want to figure out if I like these shoes. I want to try them on. I want to look in the mirror. What it did is it, at the core is it reduced the uncertainty. It wasn't just that it made shoe buying cheaper. Yes, free shipping makes shoe buying cheaper. But other research shows that you can discount a product by 10 or even $15 and still not have the same impact as free shipping. Because it's not just that it's expensive. Mm -hmm. It's that people are uncertain. I don't know whether I'm going to like this thing or not. And I don't want to have to pay for the privilege of reducing that uncertainty. Anytime we're dealing with change, you're always asking people to do something new, whether it's buy a new product, use a new service, whatever it might be. And there are always some switching costs, right? You have to pay for a new phone. You have to figure out how to integrate a new software package or whatever it might be. But it's not just that there are costs, right? Think about when the costs occur and when the benefits occur. Usually the costs of change are now. I have to pay for that product up front. I have to install that product before I can actually use it. Yes, you buy a new phone, but you don't actually figure out if it's a better phone until you've used it for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes, you might start using a new software program, a new service, and it might make things faster and easier, but you're not going to know until you've used it. And that's that cost-benefit timing gap. That's the challenge. Whenever we're asking people to make a change, costs are now and benefits are later. And to make it even worse, the costs are pretty certain, but the benefits are uncertain. Mm -hmm. How can we make it easier, mitigate that barrier by making it easier for people to experience something themselves? Another piece of the Zappos story that you may remember, I bet, Jonah, you read Eric Reese's book, The Lean Startup, is that having been an entrepreneur myself for a few decades, there was also uncertainty for Zappos among investors. And they also did this clever thing, you may recall, which is to test the concept, they put up a website and they sold people shoes and they walked down to a shoe store, paid full price for the shoes and shipped them to people at a loss in order to test whether people would actually buy shoes online. So in that sense, they were addressing the uncertainty of investors and of the entrepreneurs themselves in confirming, will people actually buy shoes online? Yeah, and, and, and that's a great example because it's the same sort of idea framed in a different way, right? Well, if I'm going to be in a shoe business, I can buy all the inventory, I can set up a factory, I can set up shipping, I can do all these things that have a lot of upfront costs and then only then start selling shoes to figure out whether it's going to work. That's a lot of upfront costs before I get any sense of whether it's actually going to work. And so what I want to do as an entrepreneur is lower that barrier to entry, right? Make it easier for me to see whether something's going to work or not. And yes, maybe I lose a couple bucks on each pair of shoes, but if I sell 2,000 shoes and I only lose $2,000, even $20,000, that's a lot cheaper way to test whether the idea is going to work than buying those 2,000 shoes before I have any sense uh, of whether it's going to work. And so really the idea is about easy uncertainty or about how can we lower the barrier to trial? You know, I underlined twice in the book a line that said something like, the ease of trying a new product is predictive of the rate of success of the adoption of new products. And I immediately emailed our team at the Next Big Idea Club about this because it, it makes a huge amount of sense. Yeah, so think about test drives for cars. Imagine car dealership said, you want to check out our car? Sure, pay us $30,000 and then we'll let you check it out. No one would ever buy a new car because the upfront cost would be so high. What test drives do, they don't change the cost of buying the car. The car still costs whatever it does, but allows people to experience a little bit before they have to pay that upfront cost. 
And so that's the key idea here, right? And and uncertainty was actually one reason I, I wrote this book in the first place. I work with a lot of companies and organizations, and this principle came up again and again, but I hadn't mm-hmm. had a chance to talk about it in any books. And so I thought this was a great opportunity to talk about it. Is you know, any business, how can you ease uncertainty? If you've got a new client, if you've got a new customer, how can you make it easier for them to experience the value of something so that they convince themselves? Freemium, you point out, is one of the great ways to make it easy to try things. And so, for instance, for us, this podcast, Next Big Idea podcast, is a free experience of our broader Next Big Idea Club community. And that has been an effective way to give people this sort of initial free experience. As you point out, freemium is a model that we now see across many, many different companies. Yeah. And and I think we think freemium, we think a certain thing, right? We give people a free version and encourage them to upgrade to to a premium version. And indeed, many organizations use that. So whether it's Dropbox, whether it's Evernote, whether it's the New York Times, LinkedIn, Skype, you guys, many businesses have this model of, hey, you know, rather than trusting us, experience this thing, figure out whether you like it. And if you like it enough, you'll be willing to pay for a more premium version. I think the neater thing to me, though, is the principle behind why freemium works is the same reason why test drives work, why renting, rather than just encouraging people to say buy skis, for example, all of these things work on the same idea, right? There's a barrier to entry to do something new. If I have to pay you a bunch of money before I know whether your service is good, if I have to pay up front to buy skis before I've ever tried skiing, it's a really costly up front. Mm-hmm. If I have to pay to buy the car before I even know if I like it, well, why am I going to do that? It's not like a test drive is freemium, right? They're not giving you a free version and then a premium version, but they're doing the same thing. They're lowering the barrier to trial. They're making it easier to experience the offering. And if you like it, you'll be more willing to pay for it. Well, thank you, Jonah, for your insights on how to change minds. My wife and children will not know what hit them after this. This has been a great education (laughs) for me. And I know all of our listeners, thank you and have a great rest of your day. No problem. Thank you so much. From Wondery, this is the next big idea. If you have thoughts about The Catalyst or any of the other books in our series, we'd love you to join the conversation with me, Jonah Berger, and other writers in this series at nextbigideaclub.com. It's a lively community of lifelong learners where you can interact with top nonfiction writers and get audio, video, and text summaries of their key insights. Sign up for three months free at nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. Special thanks this week to Jonah Berger. His book, The Catalyst, How to Change Anyone's Mind, is available wherever books are sold, or you can get a copy for free when you join us at nextbigideaclub.com slash podcast. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. This episode was written by our senior producer, Jonathan Miller. Sound designed by Jake Gorski. Our associate producer is Caleb Bissinger. Our series producer is Michael Kovnat. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.